Why the solo album now? Why after 10 years? It was, um, it was after Back to the Egg. And uh, I just wanted to do something totally different. And so I got a machine. And just plugged one single microphone into the back of the machine. And didn't use a recording console. Uh, and I was originally just going to do two weeks messing about and just have a loon for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, I'd done a few tracks, and I was starting to get into it. So I kept it another two weeks, and another two weeks, and another two weeks. I ended up having it for over six weeks or something, I think. And it just kept coming out, you know, it just kept... I, I wasn't trying to do an album. In fact, I was trying not to do an album, just for my own satisfaction and stuff. But in the end, I had a few tracks, and I played them to a couple of people, and they said, oh, I see, that's your next album. And then it occurred to me, oh, yeah, probably is. So then I got a bit serious on it and tried to make it into an album, which is the worst part of it. I was having fun till then, you know. It, two things occurred to me when I heard it yesterday for the first time. One, uh, or two names occurred to me. One was Brian Eno. The other thing that came to mind when I heard it was Stevie Wonder. I mean, is he somebody that you have a lot of Yeah, I like before? Stevie, yeah, a lot, yeah. And he's the, it's probably just because he's the only other kind of person who, who's done this way of recording an album, you know, recording it all yourself. Uh, and he did, I think it was Music of My Mind, that way, mm -hmm. where he just played everything. Did you want some sugar? Yeah. Where he played everything. Um, and in that way, yeah, that's, that's similar, you know, because I think I, the only, we're the only two people I can think of who've actually done this. Well, you're the, also the only two people I can think of who combine sort of avant-garde electronic sounds with, like, an infallible sense for melody. That's the other thing that we're... Doing. Well, I can't help that. That kind of, you know, so it's one... <laughs> no, I'm glad I can't help it, but when I was doing this album, you know, I thought I'll make something that it doesn't even sound anything like me. The first three tracks I made were the two instrumentals that are on the album and another one which I later put lyrics on, but it, three instrumentals were the first things to come out of it. Just because I wanted any, something that sounded nothing like me, you know, just nothing like it at all. But inevitably, like, you start to creep through even that, and my sense of tune or whatever it is started to even creep in. Let's go, let's, let's go back to Back to the Egg for a minute. Were you disappoint, very disappointed or shocked or surprised by the negative critical reaction? What do you attest I'm to? I'm used to all that by now. Yeah. You know, nearly everything I've ever done or been involved in has had some of that negative critical reaction. You'd think that something like She Loves You with the Beatles would be pretty positive, the reaction to that. But it wasn't. The very first week out, that was like supposed to be the worst song the Beatles had ever thought of doing. Uh, so through my uh, experience, like, you know, I've always had that. Ram was supposed to be the worst thing ever. But, um, so the criticism goes down. With Back to the Egg, it was again, it was the same kind of thing. There was a, lo a load of kind of not very good criticism. The sales weren't up to our kind of normal sales thing. So a little bit I was disappointed because I like success, you know, I like if I've done a song, I, I don't mind it going to number one, staying there for three months, you know, like I'm like everyone else. But on this album you took, on Back to the Egg, you really took a much harder rocking approach than you had in a long time. I mean, that's been a yeah, part we of you that in a sense has been submerged a little bit yeah. in wings and so on. And it seemed to work fine. It was very refreshing. Was that a reaction to, do you feel the previous criticism? Did you feel the whole new wave thing happening? It was just where I was at at the time, you know, I just, the new wave thing was happening uh, and I was thinking things like, well, you know, a lot of the new wave is just that they take things at a faster tempo than we do. We being like what I might call the permanent wave. <laughs> 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 Joke number one uh, and the last one. Uh, uh, so I realized, well, so, I mean, uh, what's wrong with us doing a, an up-tempo song? So you get something like Spin It On, mainly out of that, just because it was just up-tempo, up-tempo. And uh, I was getting influenced. I always am getting influenced, you know. Most of, like, the songs I've ever written, <clears throat> a lot of them have always had some kind of influence, either Elvis or Carl Perkins or Chuck Berry. There's always been, like, a big influence. Or even, like, some of the 30s-type tunes, like when I'm 64 or sort of Honey Pie, that's influenced by uh, Fred Astaire and people like that. So all my stuff's influenced. Back to the Egg was influenced. Just it was what I wanted to do at the time, you know, the direction I felt I hadn't been in for a while. So do a bit of that, you know. Um, the sales by most other people's standards would be like very healthy. By our standards, they weren't that good. Um, 
But I can never tell about albums. You know, it's strange. Like Venus and Mars, I never really liked till I went to a party and they played it. And it was just great. It really worked. And everyone was leaping up and down in the party, dancing everywhere. And I was sitting there with some music professor from some uh, Smith, mm -hmm. I think it was, college in America, just happened to be there. And he started kind of telling me what he thought was interesting about it. And just hearing someone else's opinion, rather than just either mine, the group's or a critic, just hearing somebody like that and seeing how crazy it was going down at this party changed my opinion of that album totally, you know. Mm. Um, I used to really think Wildlife was a kind of, oh no, we really shouldn't have done that one, because that was definitely an attempt to just leap in the studio. That kind of arose out of one single factor that we'd heard that Dylan had made an album in a week. He'd just run in and he'd finished it. And I kind of thought, yeah, that's where it's at at that time. So we'll run in and we'll do one in about a week or so. We went in, it was done very quickly. Didn't do that well. Not that that worries me, because, you know, when you've had a lot of success, it's not too bad having some that aren't big successes, because you kind of think, well, you know... That's a nice luxury. It's all right, it? yeah, it's, it's nice. Happens. It kind of pads out the sort of the other sides of your, your image rather than just all the time success. So I, I was quite... I didn't mind it, but I, I wasn't that up on it, till one day I was going down Sunset Strip, and there was this camper pulled up, the traffic lights, and some guy, just a longer guy, kind of just pulled out wildlife. He just had a copy of it, and he just said, I'm going up in the mountains, man, and I'm taking this. <laughs> said, yeah, this is the best album you've ever made, man. And that was one guy's opinion, you know. And so that's like what happens with me and my albums. I can never tell when they're right out. Yeah. The minute they're right out, I've, I'm hopeless. I'm totally confused, because I've, I've listened to record business people telling me what's the single. I've listened to people telling me that I should change this or do that, and I'm totally confused by the time an album's out. It takes a few months after, and I start to warm to it, start to hear somebody playing it at a party, and often, like, things that have happened with me is, like, I'm, I hear a sound kind of in the next room, and I think, oh, and I get jealous. I think, oh, my God, who's that, you know? And I go to the other room, and it's us. I think, <laughs> oh, I like this group. We're all right after all, you know? Because right. everyone's, like, a bit paranoid. I think it's almost universally felt that the best Wings album is Band on the Run. Do you feel that way too? Is that the most satisfying one to you? or? Uh, Band on the Run was one of those which was going to be fully a Wings album. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, Denny Sywell and Henry McCulloch, with, and Denny Lindra and myself. And what happened was uh, they failed to turn up. We had a big kind of thing, and it was one of those numbers, and just they kind of said, I don't want to go to Lagos and record this album, man, sorry. And it was like I was left in the lurch the last minute. It was literally an hour before we were getting the plane to go on this trip to Africa to record. We didn't know what the hell was in store, mm -hmm. but that was my kind of, you know, that was my first uh, hint of like there was something weird happening here. So we ended up there, just three of us in uh, Lagos. And I've played a lot of stuff myself. I played the drums myself, the bass myself, a lot of guitar with Denny, did a lot of the vocals myself. And I took a lot of control on that album. So it, it was almost a solo album, almost. When you do solo albums on both the first one and this one, there are a lot of polyrhythms. There's a lot, I mean, you're very busy on I'm, drums. I'm it's into very that. very sophisticated. You know, I, I like that. I'm into sort of African rhythms. When we went to Lagos, the best band ever I'd ever seen live in the world was this band. Is, it, the guy's in jail, I think, now or something. He's, he's a bit too political for the local authorities. I know who you mean. Fellow Ransom Kuti. Yeah. And we saw them one night at his own club. And it, I was crying. It was like, it was one of those. I mean, there was a lot of it was relief, and there was a lot of other crazy circumstances. And I just, and it, some weird things happened while we were doing that album. Like, we got held up by it with a knife and stuff. And there were all sorts of weird inner things going on during it. It was like a real fight to make that album. So from the start, you know, the two of them didn't turn up. Does that, do you find that in your experience with Wings and the Beatles, that if there is that kind of friction, that unfortunately, yeah. Can it, can it actually unfortunately, help the it does process? help. Yeah, it's an unfortunate thing because who wants to go around having <laughs> stress all the time just to help the creator? Yeah. But when it does happen, it does seem to actually help. I mean, it's a drag because it does. The logic then follows that we should all walk around even more stressed to make better albums. Which, like you know, I get to a point of thinking, who needs it? You know, hell, you know, I'd rather not make albums than do that. But I think, unfortunately, I think it does help a bit that, and it did on that one. It gave us kind of really something to fight against. Well, we were kind of going uphill all the way. I so said the two guys didn't turn up, so I had to fill in there. 
But then I kind of thought, yeah, but wait a minute, I love playing drums. Ha ha, great. And the positive side started to creep in. I'd heard that, that on some of the later Beatle albums that, it, that actually some of the drumming was either done by you or else you gave Ringo very direction little, for it? Very little. Very little. I gave him a what? Gave him a sort of direction for We it, always gave Ringo direction on every single number. Really? Uh -huh. hmm. It's hardly ever a number when we just said, OK, play what you feel. Mainly it was very controlled. Whoever had written the song, if it was John, he'd say, I want this. And obviously a lot of stuff was came out of what Ringo was playing anyway, but we would always control it. There would, there would hardly ever be like a break where we all didn't look at that break and think, right, we don't want anything here. I mean, some of the kind of reasons for the breakup, you know, were things like in, I mean, minor reasons for it, some of the contributory things were like, because for instance, on Hey Jude, I told George not to play guitar because he wanted to play Hey Jude, do, 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 do. don't make it bad, do, 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 do. take a sad song, do, do, do. he wanted to echo in phrases, you know, and I really didn't see it like that, and it was a bit of a number to, for me to have to dare to tell George Harrison, one of the, you know, whichever way you look at it, one of the greats, I think, to not play. It was like an insult, almost. So, but we were quite, we, that was how we did a lot of our stuff, you know. Um, was there that when we were talking about tension again and creative tension and how even if it's a pain in the ass it can be useful? Yeah. Are there any particular albums that you White remember? album. The white album. The, was the say, tension yeah. album. The Beatles. That was the big tension album. The rest were pretty sort of untense, not that bad, or there'd be one bit of tense and then no more tense and stuff. But right the white album was we were all in the middle of the sort of psychedelic thing or just coming out of it or whatever, but it was weird, you know, I mean I mean, never before we recorded with like beds in the studio and kind of people visiting for hours on end and business meetings and all of this. And there was a lot of friction during that album. I remember once Helter Skelter came about because I read in the Melody Maker that The Who, they were talking about a track they made. Now, I don't know what the track was because I never actually heard anything that sounded like the talk. Yeah. But the talk was the loudest, most raucous, rock and rolling, dirtiest thing we've ever done, man. And I don't know what they were talking about. It would have been maybe an album track or something. Never caught up with what track was. But that made me think, ooh, gotta do it. Yeah. I really see that. And I totally got off on that one little sentence in the paper. And I said, we've gotta do the most loudest, most raucous, and that ended up as Helter Skelter. That, that was the one that sounded the most fragmented to me, and whereas Abbey Road sounded the smoothest. You know, I was imagine there was a lot of tension at the time of Abbey Road, too. Wasn't no, it? there wasn't. Well, there was actually, yeah, looking back on it, but it didn't feel like a tense album. There were one or two tense moments. Mm -hmm. But uh, Abbey Road for me wasn't that tense because I was getting into a lot of musical ideas and kind of the, the, uh, the medley thing on the second side. I was very up on doing that and very sort of excited about doing that stuff. And most of the stuff, I can't remember it being quite as tense. I think White Album was like the weirdest period because we were about to break up, you know, and that was just tense in itself. What about your, I want to ask you about your bass playing. Um, in a sense, you, to me, you've always, you kind of play bass like a frustrated guitar player. It's sort of an inverted kind of genius. Did, I mean, was the bass kind of forced on you when your bass player died? And uh, no, it was before that. It was, uh, I originally went to Hamburg. I'd never been in a group or anything before, and we played around and we just skiffled around. I didn't have any instrument, never actually thought of buying an instrument. I was just kind of musical and just used to bang away, let's say, the piano at home, or I had a little guitar. Started off, I mean, the whole history is that my dad bought me a trumpet, and I tried to play trumpet and learned the saints and a couple of things, but my lip was going funny, and I realized I wouldn't be able to sing while I was playing a trumpet. I liked singing, so I traded that in for a guitar, which was a right-handed one. I couldn't work out how I couldn't play it. <laughs> and I eventually realized I had to turn it the, the right way you for me. You and Jimi Hendrix, yeah. So I turned it like the right way, and amazingly, um, upon amazing, it, it felt good, you know, and I could actually, I was strumming with the right hand now, the correct hand, and I could get a lot more feel on it. And uh, I traded, I got a guitar to go out to Hamburg, which is called a Ro Rossetti Lucky 7. It was like one of, the, one of the worst ever made. It was just a hunk of plywood with a pickup on it. And Strings two feet off the board. That yeah, it was the worst action going, you know, but it, was, it looked good. And that was the whole thing then. So I got to Hamburg and played for a while just as a guitar player and just played guitar. We used to have three guitars. It was John, me and George. And we used to say to people, we don't need a drummer. The rhythm's in the guitars, man. 
when they used to book us, you know, we'd, they'd say, I haven't got a drummer, we'd, the rhythms and the guitar. So we, we went there and we had a drummer then, and then we had Stu on bass. Stu decided he wanted to stay in Hamburg, and my guitar by that time had fallen apart. Mm -hmm. It eventually got smashed, you know, in a pre-Townsend Fury uh, one night. And I used to sort of just put, piece it together and then plug it in with like, not plug it in rather, just play it unplugged in. And then I got put on, I, it eventually just fell apart. I just could, there's no way I could even pretend to use it anymore. So I turned to the piano, because like that was the only instrument left for me. So I had a little spell of just playing piano, which time I kind of learned quite a little bit, you know, learned my way a little bit around piano. And then eventually Stuart, who was our bass player, was going to, uh, stay in Hamburg and so there was good, there was a kind of changeover and he like handed over to me and he lent me his bass and I had to play that upside down because he didn't want the st strings turned over and messed around too much so I was playing bass upside down it's a real cock-eyed way you to played kind of, I mean, you played the strings upside down I just boogie. played guitar boogie like in a, in a mirror yeah I just played boom 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 coming this way instead right, of going down right. uh, so that was a kind of crazy time but you know, I, I managed that. And then eventually I got my own bass and I was kind of in on bass. So I, I was always like a frustrated guitarist playing bass. Those melodic lines, particularly the ones that showed up on Sgt. Pepper, were, I mean, there was no precedent for that in rock music. Because I was just getting on with bass and just always the stuff I'd always liked had been little lines that worked and yet had their own little identity instead of just staying in the background. By then, anyway, bass was coming up to the fore in mixes. Yeah. As you listen to early Beatle mixes and the bass and the bass drum aren't there. We were starting to take over ourselves and bass was coming to the fore anyway, so I had to do something with it when it was getting in the fore. I was listening to a lot of kind of uh, Motowns and Marvin Gaye and Stax and stuff, which were putting some nice little bass lines in. But I think the big influence was uh, Pet Sounds, mm. Beach Boys. That was the album Flip Me. Still does, actually. Still one of my favourite albums of all time. Mm. Just because the musical invention on that is like, wow. Well, that was the big thing for me. I just thought, oh, dear me, this is the album of all time. What the hell are we going to do? So my ideas took f off from that standard, and I wanted to do stuff beyond that. So my bass playing started. I don't know if that was a direct result of that, but I was thinking along those lines. And uh, so Sergeant Pepper kind of eventually came out, basically from the idea that I had about this band. It was going to be an album of another band that wasn't us. We were going to call ourselves. I mean, and just imagine all the time that it wasn't us playing this album. And it was just a nice little mind warp to get you to see the album, because when you're too close, it, it le lent distance to the album. So I had this song written of Sergeant Pepper, and he was 20 years ago, and he taught us to play, and we're his protégés, and here we are. And then John had some good songs that he'd been writing at the time, Day in the Life, and to mention a few. And we worked on those and finished those. And George wasn't very involved in that album. He just had one song, really. It's really the only time during the whole album, main time, I remember him turning up. That's interesting. It, what you're saying then is that, that looking at it from my side, I remember picking it up in 66 and listening to it. And I thought, my god, this is the perfect fantasy album, but in the sense of creative fantasy. I mean, you, you put yourself yeah. into another world with it. So that's yeah. really the way you went about creating it. Yeah. Too. Oh, yeah. Is I kind of had the idea somewhere, like on a. Th that was the whole idea. The cover was supposed to originally. The cover was going to be us dressed as this other band, in kind of crazy gear. But it was all going to be stuff that we'd always wanted to wear. All stuff that like we always secretly really liked, and it may have been there. And we were going to have photos on the wall, which were all our heroes. And it could be anything. It could be Marlon Brando in his leather jacket, or it could be Einstein. It could be anybody we'd all ever thought. Oh, he was good. And it was going to be this band and all their cult heroes. Mm -hmm. And we kind of put this other identity on them Hi. to do it. Yeah. And um, that was how it turned out. You know, the cover got changed a lot, you know, in the, in the process. But that was the basic idea behind it, you know, kind of fantasy show, you know. When, you, when you're thinking back on that period, was, would you say that was the apex of that feeling of expansion and creativity that was going on at the time, would you, what album would you say caught that at its height during uh, that time? Pepper, probably. Yeah. I think probably Pepper, uh, you know, Rubber everyone's Rubber got Soul's their such a departure. I mean, that was... Rubber Soul. I don't know that. I, to, to me, all I can remember is that was a kind of straightforward album. 
But you know, we were it's beginning. Like it's all acoustic though. Yeah, I mean, that was very daring. Sounds, we were into. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you listen to like, uh, "Hey, you got to hide your love away," that's John doing Dylan, right. basically, because Dylan had just come out, and we were big fans of Dylan. Um, so a, lo a lot of the things would be that kind of thing, you know. Rubber Soul was just like a funny title. You know, that's the sort of bit I remember most about it, just being a kind of catchy, silly title. Can I? A, I? A lot of people like that as an album. I haven't heard it, tell you the truth. It's got to be over 10 years. It's, it's funny. It's among like connoisseurs, it's considered like one of the high points, one of the early high points. And the joke is, you know, just to show you kind of how you, how you can be wrong, you know, you can always make mistakes. I was really, at one point, I remember being in Germany on tour, playing the album just before it came out. I got real down because I thought it was all out of tune. Really? It really brought down everyone I kind of had to tell me. It was when we were trying to think of the title, Revolver. Oh, Revolver was the one I was talking about. I thought it was out of tune. Rubber Souls and all. Cut. <laughs> right, when you talk, it's, you know, we're talking about this thing about your impression of your work versus somebody else's impression. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about, there's a thing, I was talking with Robert Fripp, you know Robert yeah. Fripp, King Crimson, whatever. Uh -huh. and he's, he's writing a piece for us, and he was talking about an artist's image, and how an artist's image has a life of its own, yeah. right? And in the sense that, that you're Paul McCartney, and you're this human being, you've got talents and tastes and so on, but in a sense almost there's a Robert Fripp or there's a Paul McCartney, which, as Johnny Leiden would say, which has a public image, which people tend to relate to sometimes instead of relating to you as a person. Is this, I mean, this is something you've had to deal with through Wings and through the Beatles. What, when you first encountered this, was this something, I mean, was it, was it like prison? Was it enjoyable? Did it cause a conflict in you when, you when you felt that, when you saw people reacting to you as... I remember hearing that, that you guys, when you were in the Beatles, that you used to sort of say, well, you know, why all the screaming? I mean, can't you just listen to the music? At first, you're just an ordinary Joe rocking around trying to make a living. Um, then you get famous, you get your first hit, and people ask you for your autograph, and you love it. There's nothing you want more than to do any, any amount of autographs. You, you know, you want them, I'll do them. Right. And you just do, you love it. That kind of wears off after about three or four years. You just suddenly start to think, wait a minute, what am I bloody signing for you for? You know, so and so. And I've come through another phase now of just thinking, oh yeah, it's okay again. So I've been like in and out of that phase, and fame's the same thing. I remember thinking at one time where I've come to some kind of point of no return where no matter even now if I say I don't want to be famous anymore, I'll be like Bridget Bardo, where she'll be a recluse but still very famous, or Charlie Chaplin. They want to get away from it. And I remember thinking, oh, well, that's no use because, you know, they're going to be after me even more. So those kind of things do come in. I think it's a very weird thing, fame. The interesting thing for me is that the only people who can ever write about it or any, ever get near to even explaining it most often don't want to because it's the people who are famous themselves rather than right. the analysts or the commentators on it because the commentators can't quite get behind that mask until they're famous commentators and even then it's still not it's the same thing. It's still a different thing so there is a very weird kind of double-edged sword to fame do you but, think that's, um, that was john's reaction why he's, he's sort of no I, I i don't i actually don't know or don't really like to speak for john but Seeing as you ask me, like my theory is just that he's done enough. He thinks he's done enough in all the things he wanted to do, except um, being himself. And I think now he's actually just turned on to actually living his own life, sod everyone else. But it's not an aggressive thing, I don't think, from what I can see. I got the feeling that when you started Wings, that that in a sense, it, to me, it, it's. It felt like you had more security, more confidence. I don't want to get into a comparison, thing, uh, but I mean, after being in the Beatles, you know, where can one go after that? It's difficult that? to top. It's difficult to top, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the other three and so on must have felt some trepidation about going out like that, and they were more tentative. You didn't seem to. Well, have that I didn't thought. seem to, but that's one of my, that's one of the features of me. Because I may seem to not do a lot of things, but in actual fact, I can be just as bad as the next man. The first gigs we did with Wings were like frightening, you know. <laughs> and it was just a question of like, either I'm going to have a sing, in which case I've got to go through that frightening bit. Um, I, I used to be frightened also in the Beatles. I remember many times just sitting outside concert halls, being collected by the local police to be taken to, and just thinking, I really don't want to go through with this. 
you know, I've let's we've got enough money, let's take the money and run, <laughs> and let's go down to Brighton. <laughs> but I mean, we felt Linda and I felt that when she was having our last baby, because there she was as pregnant as anything, due to have the baby, and there's this terrible desire, like let's go to Brighton instead, and almost <laughs> driving us to hospital. If we could have got away with it, we would have gone to Brighton. And the Wings things were like that, you know, it was like so scary coming out with a kind of totally new band and knowing it was the Beatles was what was being expected. But it was just a question of knowing I had to go run that gauntlet and go through that thing and just once I had a suspicion that once I came out the other side of it, I'd feel better about it. When was it that you went around doing those, those uh, tours of universities with Wings where you just popped in? That was, was that one of the tour? very first things we did. I'm not I mean, sure that it was is the like, very first, it was one of the first. I mean, that's, in a sense, the philosophy of the 80s now, that type of impromptu thing. What, what brought you to do that? Well, the thing was, like, um, I would, had a new band after the Beatles, and so the only way to not make it, like, a great problem was that instead of just doing what was expected, I just thought, well, what would I really like to do? What have I missed being in the Beatles, and what haven't I caught up on, and what, what is it time to do now for mm. me? And one of the things, like, there were silly little things, like with the Beatles, you used to get paid massively, mm -hmm. but it, you never saw it. You never saw any money, because it always went in a company, and sometimes mm -hmm. you were allowed to draw on the company. So to me, one of the buzzes of that first tour was actually getting a bag of uh, coins, which we then would... I mean, it's not, it wasn't kind of just a materialistic thing. It was like, really, here we are being actually physically paid. And it was like going back to square one. It was really like going back. I think the only way I figured I could do it was by taking it back to where the Beatles started, just in the halls. And we charged 50p to get in, you know, which like we obviously could have charged a lot more. And we'd give the students' union a bit for having us. And it was just all very down home. And we'd play poker with the money afterwards. And I'd, I'd actually pay the band physically, you know, 50p for you, 50p for. And it brought back the kind of thrill of like actually working for a living. Can you empathize with the new wave thing? Did you, in terms of the early Beatles and when you were in Hamburg, did you feel that same explosive force? Did you have that same kind of Yeah, I think it's always the same. Attitude? I think it's always the same, and hopefully it will always be the same. To me, it's just age. It's just a question of age. That when we were 18, we were doing it and getting exactly the same reaction only 20 years before that the new wave is getting now. Which is just people saying, wow, that's freaky, man. You know, even Sergeant Pepper, you know, even when we were well into it. Um, we, we were doing exactly what they were doing. We were being a rock and roll group. It got christened Mersey Beat, which we always hated, you know. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them hate the new wave tag because they think of themselves just as bands and just this and that. It's just tags, you know, it'll always go on. In 20 years' time, there'll be 18 year old boys and girls wanting to start something new. A lot of the clothes like the kids are into now, if you kind of look back, you see a lot of old rockers into all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. you see a lot of people doing things. I mean, Keith Richards, like, got to be one of the original punks. You know, his right. general look fits in very well, you know. Um, but I don't care about all that, you know. So when we started off with the Beatles, John and I sat down to write some songs. We wrote about the first 50 or so out of which I think Love Me Do is the only one ever got published. The rest just vanished in the mist of time. Except I've got a notebook somewhere under masses of everything that, that's got them written down. The thing at the time we were trying to do, which made those songs not very good, was one of the things, we were trying to find the next beat. Because everyone was talking about it, all the musicals, it was in New Musical Express then, a lot, lot more gentle paper than it is now. It's like a long time ago, and uh, they were talking about rock calypso, you know, Latin rock is going to be the next, and we used to sit around there thinking, now what's going to be the next beat, and we'd write, and when, the minute we stopped trying to find that next beat, the newspaper said, it's Mersey beat, and we found that we discovered the next beat without even trying to discover it, and so that was what made me suspicious of categories and trying to find this mm. and this and that, and putting everyone into, they're the heavy metal because they were leather and they go louder, they're the more sort of ballady because they do that. Like I've never felt in any particular sort of group, you know, my musical tastes range from like Fred Astaire to the Sex Pistols, you know, and through everything else. 